Dear friends, associates, associates of darkened, sympathizers, victims, family members, and freedom lovers here and abroad. My name is James Snedden. I'm the older brother of David Snedden, believed to, been, to have been abducted in August 2004 in Zhongjian, China, or modernly labeled Shangri-La. David is currently held against his will in the DPRK. For my brother, the last known location where he had freedom was anything but a proverbial Shangri-La. It actually, it's actually painfully ironic, that name, at least for my brother and my family. I will speak to you candidly, and in a form I hope will bring to life in a more poignant way the plight and pain of abduction victims, and indeed, all the downtrodden citizens of North Korea who suffer silently. I will use facts we've confirmed for witnesses of David's voice. Wow, I can't believe school at Beijing University's Chinese language program is I'm here in Beijing, but I can't wait to trek through Western China with George. Is David's friend and the last American known to see David before captivity. We leave soon. This is going to be exciting. Need to tie up some loose ends still. Need to finalize a place to live back at BYU. Need to get prepared for the LSAT in grad school. Have only about a year left. Need to prepare for my work in Seoul with Mike's company, but this will be a fun few weeks. The past several days have been incredible. George and I had so much fun trekking around Sichuan province but he needed to head off and I'm on my own. Need to email mom so she doesn't worry. Running low on funds, but should be able to make it through. I plan to hike Tiger Leaping Gorge next and travel to a city called Shangri-La where I should be able to see lots of Tibetans and other tribal people. This is awesome. Arrived in Lijiang, such a fun city with the waterways in Old Town. Emailed mom, told her I'm off to a bus for Tiger Leaping Gorge. Here is the last email written from David. I'm in Lijiang, Western Yunnan province. I will take a bus to hike Tiger Leaping Gorge in about a half hour. I'm having a great time here, but nonetheless, I am excited to come home. Wow, the gorge was amazing, but not as remote or rugged as I expected. I saw many different kinds of tribal people, Nashi, Yi, Tibetans, and even school children walking the trail. It was such fun running into the Chinese tourist group. Good conversations and good company. I'm tired, though. Glad to arrive in Tina's guest house to rest. Tomorrow I'm off to Shangri-La. Stopped by Walnut Grove this morning. It's different than the description in the Lonely Planet book, but I had to check it out. I'm here, finally here, Shangri-La. It's amazing and seems almost like the Wild West. Lots of ethnic people. I see yak meat drying in shop windows and the temple on the outskirts of town, incredible. That was the, the Tibetan experience I was been looking for. I also found this great little Korean cafe called Yak Bar. Love finding some comfort food and speaking Korean again. David was fluent in Korean, having served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Seoul, South Korea for two years. I'll stop by again tomorrow before I go head back to Shoto and retrieve my backpack. Maybe I'll have one last yummy Korean meal. I can't see a thing. My head hurts. What happened? Why am I bound up? Who are these people and what do they want with me? What did I do? I hear Chinese, but also Korean? I'm scared. I'm really scared. I'm hungry. I've soiled myself and I'm sore. I hear Korean still, but there are other languages around me I don't understand. Where are they taking me? It's been days. I'm losing track of time. I haven't seen light for who knows how long. Cars, trucks, two other trucks, and now a boat? What happened? I'm really in trouble. My parents won't forgive me for going alone in China. Why didn't I stay with George? I need water, so thirsty. My body hurts. They hit me all the time. Slapping, kicking, a punch here and there. Blood is crusted in my nose. It's hard to breathe, it's so humid and hot. I'm nauseated. My body is too tired to vomit anymore. I smell like death. I hear more Korean now. It's a little different sounding, but Korean for sure. Where am I? The beatings, why do they hate me so much? Why do they torture me so much? What did I do? I just want to go home. I want to see my family. Mama. I'm here now. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here to help serve the great leader, teach English, and fight against my home. What happened? I miss my home. 
My teeth hurt with those braces. I want to just yank them off, even pull my teeth out because of the pain. It's been years. The beatings are fewer now. I'm fed adequately. I'm not in the work camp anymore. I've seen others. Where are they from? It's better, I guess. The winters are so cold and I don't have adequate clothing. I'm surviving. I miss my family. I miss my home. God, are you anywhere to be found? They gave me a woman to marry. She's nice, I guess, but this is not the life I choose. This is not the hopes of our dreams. This is not me. I don't know who I am anymore, really. I'm here to serve the great leader. I love my kids. I wish they could meet their cousins. They often separate us. Why? Why can't they just let us alone? I'm here to serve the people. I'm here to serve. Will I ever see my family? Will I ever return home? Will I live my life out here forever? It's been 15 years. Have they all forgotten? Do they care? Are my parents alive? They're so old by now. My children help me smile, but I'm so lonely still. I wanna walk alone. I wanna hike in the mountains. I wish to see hockey again. They're coming for me. Something about helping the great leader with English expressions. Maybe they'll let me go. Ladies and gentlemen, while David indeed suffers, there are thousands of North Koreans in various kinds of prison, political, and re-education camps. Reports by these released speak of hor horrific atrocities, including regular torture, exhausting work regimes, illness, starvation, and executions, even of children. Mr. Kang Myung-do, a defector of North Korea, recently spoke in my city. He recounted a recent incident where a mother and daughter attempted to cross the China-North Korean border were shot by machine gun and shared video of the same. I quote, the mother got hit, so the daughter tried to rescue the mom and they shot the daughter and mother together. According to a former camp guard, Am Yong Choi of Camp 22, the guards are trained to treat the, the detainees as subhuman. He gave an account of children in one camp who were fighting over corn, retrieved from cow dung. As piercing to the ear this sounds, it speaks nothing of North Korean citizens who live daily effectively in prison without freedoms and choices we each take for granted. Yes, David is a victim and inductive of North Korea's cast, cruel, and inhumane regime. But all citizens of that regime suffer equally through daily atrocities, acts of the state that are simply criminal. Yes, I want my brother released and able to choose how he lives, independently and free. Yet in the same breath, I can't ignore the beleaguered and silent voices of the North Korean people. Enough is enough. It's time to release David. It's time to release and free the noble people of North Korea. It's time. It's past time. Thank you. James, thank you to you and all the other family members who are here with us today. This has been an overwhelming outpouring. Our final witness, Mr. Ban Jong Pan Choi, who is the nephew of Anocha Pan Choi, a Thai national who is believed to have been abducted by DPRK agents while in Macau in 1978. Mr. Pan Choi, the floor is yours. สวัสดีครับผมปัจจงปัจจ้อยซึ่งเป็นหลานชายของอโนชาปัจจ้อยผู้ถูกลักพาตัวโดยเกาหลีเหนือที่หายไปประมาณ 40 ได้รับข่าวจากสํานักข่าวที่ประเทศไทยว่าอโนชาถูกลักพาตัวโดยแต่ก็ไม่รู้ว่าจะมีชีวิตจริงหรือไม่ทางครอบครัวก็มีความหวังว่าที่ผมมาวันนี้ก็มีความหวังว่าอโนชาคงจะได้กลับมาสักวันห
โดยไม่รู้สาเหตุว่าเหตุใดถึงเกาหลีเหนือถึงได้ลักพาตัวอนุชาไปหลายฝ่ายให้ความสนใจกับการหายไปของอนุชาตอนนั้นมีทั้งรัฐบาลญี่ปุ่นสังคมไทยรัฐบาลไทยแล้วก็ผู้สื่อข่าวจากทั่วโลกไปทำข่าวกับอนุชาที่บ้านอนุชาหายไปหายจากมาเกา๊าเมื่อปี2521เป็นเวลา27ปีนะตอนนั้นทางครอบครัวก็รอการกลับมาของอนุชาคุณพ่อของอนุชาเสียเสียชีวิตไปก่อนที่อนุชาจะทราบข่าวก่อนที่จะทราบข่าวว่าอนุชาหายตัวถูกถูกลักพาตัวอยู่ที่เกาหลีเหนือเป็นเวลา27ปีตอนนั้นคุณพ่อของอนุชาเสียเสียชีวิตก่อนที่จะเสียก่อนที่จะทราบข่าวของอนุชาตอนนั้นคุณพ่อเสียชีวิตไปประมาณสามเดือนสามเดือนของการจากไปของพ่อของโนชาแต่เป็นเป็นสามเดือนที่มีความเศร้าในขับครอบครัวสิ่งที่สิ่งที่ครอบครัวได้รับจากหลายฝ่ายหลายหลายฝ่ายทั้ง NGO และก็กลุ่มช่วยเหลือผู้ถูกลักพาตัวโดยเกาหลีเหนือจากญี่ปุ่นผมก็ได้ไปค้มขึ้นเวทีพูดกับหลายหลายหลายที่ทางครอบครัวมีความรู้สึกว่าไปแต่ละครั้งหวังว่าอนุชาจะได้กลับมาบ้านจะได้กลับมาหาครอบครัวที่อบอุ่นแต่ณถึงตอนนี้ยังไม่มีความหวังเลยยิ่งสังคมไทยตอนนี้ก็ไม่ให้ความสนใจกับครอบครัวเป็นเท่าไหร่เพราะว่าสังคมไทยคงจะเห็นว่าครอบครัวของโนชานี่เป็นครอบครัวคนบ้านนอกครอบครัวเล็กๆที่อยู่ที่เกาหลีเหนือคงจะไม่เห็นความสำคัญของคนไทยคนหนึ่งการหายไปของอนุชาเป็นเวลาสี่สิบกว่าปีณตอนนี้ยังไม่ได้ทราบข่าวข่าวว่าอนุชายังมีชีวิตอยู่หรือไม่ทางครอบครัวก็หวังเป็นอย่างยิ่งว่าผมมาครั้งนี้คงจะได้ได้รับข่าวดีจากหลายฝ่ายผมกับผมขอกราบขอบพระคุณทางรัฐบาลญี่ปุ่นที่ดำเนินการช่วยเหลือให้ผมได้กลับมาในวันนี้ได้ได้กลับมาขึ้นเวทีในวันนี้Ever stop until all survivors, each and every one of them, return to their families. This conference is also about seeking answers, seeking ways to bring those family members back home. And I'm now going to turn toward our expert panel. I am joined by three most distinguished scholars and diplomats. Uh, our first panelist is going to be Dr. Junya Nishino, who's a professor at the Department of Political Science, Faculty of Law and Politics at Keio University in Japan, in Tokyo. He also serves as the director of the Center for Contemporary Korean Studies at Keio University. Our second panelist is going to be the Honorable Evans Revere, who is a formal principal deputy assistant secretary of state for East Asia. 
and Pacific Affairs, a very well-known expert within the world of Asia-Pacific Affairs. He's currently a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, and uh, among many other talents, he's fluent in Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. And finally, um, His Excellency, Dr. Yi Jong-hun, former ambassador at large on North Korean human rights, Republic of Korea. Ambassador Lee is a professor at Yonsei University, where he founded the, um, the Center for uh, Human Liberty, and he also established the SAGES Group on North Korean Human Rights. He has continued to advise numerous government and non-governmental bodies on a variety of issues, but first and foremost, the issue of North Korean human rights. I'm going to ask our distinguished panelists to keep their remarks to up to five minutes, and I am going to begin by giving the floor to Professor Nishino. Thank you, moderator. Uh, I want to extend my thanks to the organizers of this event for inviting me to the symposium on the very important topic, the abduction issues by North Korea. So we've seen very dramatic process between the United States and North Korea and South Korea on the Korean Peninsula since the beginning of last year. We've strongly hoped that Chairman Kim Jong-un made a strategic decision to be a responsible member of the international community by abandoning nuclear and ballistic missile capability and by respecting the norms and the rules of the international community, such as human rights. But very regrettably, Kim Jong-un has yet to show, yet to take any concrete action for denuclearization of North Korea and yet to show any sincere attitude of respect for human rights. Kim Jong-un delivered his administrative policy speech last month and asked the United States to make a bold decision and concession regarding nuclear negotiation by the end of this year. But it is Kim Jong-un who should and must make a bold decision immediately if he really wants his nation to be a prosperous one, as he has repeatedly mentioned in his speech. Without any concrete, concrete action for denuclearization, improving the human rights situation in North Korea, and solving the abduction issue, it is impossible for North Korea to gain any economic assistance, economic support from the international community, which could contribute to the brighter future of North Korea. So we tend to focus on nuclear issue in the current negotiation process with North Korea, but we should pay more attention to the total whole picture of North Korean problem, including the abduction issues and human rights situation in North Korea. So this is why President Trump and President Moon Jae-in of South Korea raised the abduction issue when, he held, when they held a summit meeting with Kim Jong-un last year and this year. So we should warn again all concerned parties involved in the negotiation process with North Korea that avoiding the topic of human rights in North Korea could jeopardize sustainable agreement in the future. It is imperative that human rights are not sidelined in any future talks with North Korea, as the human rights situation in North Korea should be improved immediately, and the issue of the Japanese abductee must be solved in the very short term. The voices, the voices of families of the Japanese abductees and the victims of human rights abuses by North Korean regime remind us that we must not shy away from raising the human rights issues in the negotiation with North Korea. The international community has repeatedly expressed grave concern on the human rights situation in North Korea, as Mr. Izuka mentioned, 
and the report of the Commission of Inquiry in 2014 urges North Korea to take concrete action to improve the human rights in North Korea, including the abduction issues. The international community should continue to facilitate giving more prominence to human rights in North Korea. So lastly, in regard to the issue of the Japanese abductee, it is true that we all Japanese have been really angry at North Korea's criminal behavior, but at the most important thing for us at this point, at this moment, is that the abductees are safely back to Japan and reunited with their families in Japan immediately. So as families mentioned, time is really running out. If North Korean leader shows sincere attitude and take concrete action to solve the issue, the Japanese government has prepared, to, prepared for improving the relationship with North Korea in accordance with the 2002 Pyongyang Declaration in which set the comprehensive roadmap to the diplomatic normalization between Japan and North Korea, including Japan's economic assistance to North Korea. Finally, the international community should continuously urge Kim Jong-un to choose right way, right path, not only for all of the abductee, but also for the people in North Korea. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Nishino. Next, we will give the floor to the Honorable Evans Revere. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a very uh, special honor for me to be, be part of this program and to be here to support this important effort to remind my fellow Americans and members of the international community of the loss and the suffering that the family members who spoke so eloquently earlier continue to endure. My compliments to the government of Japan, to Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga, to Ambassador Besho, and to the sponsoring governments who have made this event possible today, and a special thanks for allowing me to be a part of it. I also want to express my heartfelt appreciation to the family members who shared their stories with us today. Your courage, your determination, and your leadership of this important cause are inspirational and deeply moving. You deserve and will have our full support. As a former career diplomat, the fate of Japanese and American abductees and of Americans imprisoned in North Korea has been at the heart of my work for several decades. So too has the suffering of 25 million North Korean people who continue to endure unspeakable horrors about which we now know so much thanks to the work of the many defectors who risked their lives to escape to freedom and to tell us the truth. Over the years, I have discussed the cases of Americans and Japanese citizens directly with North Korean officials here in New York, including in this building, in Washington, in Pyongyang, in Berlin, Stockholm, Geneva, and other cities. In those meetings, I told the North Koreans that the DPRK would never be a normal country, nor would it be accepted into the international community unless it wiped away the stain on its reputation caused by its abduction and kidnapping of foreigners, arrest and imprisonment of visitors, and its terrible treatment of its own citizens. These arguments over the years usually fell on deaf ears. But there were instances in which the DPRK leadership realized the need to do the right thing. And they did release several Americans. And there were also interesting cases in which my DPRK counterparts actually agreed quietly with my arguments. But for the families we heard from today, there has been no respite from suffering. And in the case of Otto Warmbier, we saw a horrific act of torture and abuse that reminded us of the nature of the regime that we deal with. All the families, the suffering continues, and so does their search for the truth about their loved ones, as well as their struggle for justice 
and closure. All of this requires us to hold the North Korean regime accountable. We must continue to demand investigations into the whereabouts of those who disappeared, and we must demand that those who are still alive be returned to their families. The North Korean regime, which knows down to the last detail what happens on its soil, knows what happened to those abductees. It is time for Pyongyang to reveal the truth. In my experience, the best way to do this is to remind the Pyongyang regime that its future economic success, its access to normal trading relations and the international banking system, the removal of the sanctions and the normalization of relations with Japan, the United States, and others, and the benefits that will flow from that will require the DPRK to resolve all outstanding issues, including the profound human rights-related concerns we have heard about today. This is the price the regime will have to pay for acceptance as a normal country. When I traveled to Pyongyang with former Secretary of Defense William Perry in 1999, we told the North Korean leadership bluntly that the DPRK must choose one of two paths. Cooperation and dialogue to secure a better future for the North Korean people or confrontation and darkness. That is still the choice Pyongyang faces. But today, we have the means to make that choice even starker for North Korea. And we should do so instead of apologizing for or excusing the actions of a brutal regime. This, this is the time to ignore the former senior U.S. official who argued that we should pay the bill that the North Koreans sent us after they abused Otto Warmbier and sent him home to die. And let's try to Dr. put out of e. our Jong minds former that the U.S. president said that he Lord. hold the North Korean leader responsible for Otto's death and that he believed Kim Jong-un's denials about Otto's fate. Our mission is straightforward going forward. This is the time to use the tools at our disposal to compel North Korea to make the right choice. Humanity demands that we do this. And history will remember whether we had the courage to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revere. Our next speaker is His Excellency Ambassador Lee Jong-hun. I would also like to join the others um, in expressing my appreciations to the organizers and the co-sponsors, the missions of Australia and the United States uh, and the European Union. Um, I'm particularly thankful to the principal organizer, of the Japanese government, uh, Minister Suga, uh, Ambassador Besho, uh, and all those uh, who's, who's been involved in not only raising this issue of abduction, uh, but trying to find a solution uh, to a problem that has lasted uh, over four decades now. Um, I think everyone here will join me in, in expressing how moved we were of the testimonials given by the uh, family members of the victims. Um, I, do, uh, I would like to express my deep sympathy I, I really sincerely hope that our small effort can uh, eventually lead to a breakthrough uh, in the impasse. But that will take a great deal of resolve, not only with the family members and the like-minded people, but certainly, I mean, we are here at this venue, the United Nations. Uh, we have many uh, UN Security Council resolutions on North Korea, but they're all for WMDs, uh, the nuclear nuclear tests. We don't have a uh, the Security Council resolution on North Korea and human rights. I think that's the kind of resolve by the international community, particularly the United Nations and the Security Council, that will uh, eventually see to a happy ending to the kind of problem that we're having that we're faced uh, with today. That said. Um, 
I cannot personally um, hide my disappointment uh, with the recent trend uh, on the on the political developments um, over the North Korean human rights issues, including the abduction issue. The human rights issues has taken a backseat to a couple of major political developments. The first political development, of course, is the diplomatic summits. Uh, all of a sudden, in the past two years, Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, uh, is at the center stage of international news, meeting dignitaries, uh, meeting President Trump, meeting uh, President Moon, uh, Moon Jae-in, meeting Xi Jinping, uh, so on and so forth, all in the name of denuclearization. That hasn't helped the human rights uh, cause. The second uh, political development uh, that has served as an obstacle to finding a resolution on the human rights issues is the initiative for some sort of a uh, peaceful ending or peace initiatives, peace mood on the Korean Peninsula. And this has led to a situation where the human rights issues have really been uh, de-emphasized. So the diplomatic summits uh, in the name of denuclearization and the peace mood on the Korean Peninsula have unfortunately uh, led to a situation where the human rights issues have been um, swept under the carpet, if you will. It's left the human rights component uh, completely in a limbo. I would like to say uh, for the record that probably with absolute certainty, without an improvement, a genuine improvement in human rights condition, there's never ever going to be a real peace on the Korean Peninsula. In that light, I think how we approach and deal with North Korea um, is in terms of its strategic approach is grossly miscalculated. Instead of shunning uh, human rights in the name of all these other political uh, objectives, I think human rights is the issue that the international community should be really focusing on, including the abduction issue. Why? It's because if there is one thing that North Korea is extremely sensitive about, it is about the international community's image of its human rights condition. It's quite different from its WMDs. We see time and again, North Korea, despite the international community's desire to denuclearize North Korea, North Korea flaunts its nuclear cap capability. We've had numerous missile launches and nuclear tests, and it is not afraid to show the world what it has. With human rights issue, it's a completely different story. It's just the opposite. North Korea wants to hide its human rights conditions. It doesn't want the world to know exactly what is happening in North Korea. Case in point, back in 2014, we, we've had the uh, Commission of Inquiry report, and a lot of the aspects that was in the COI report was about to be reflected in the General Assembly resolution. And all of a sudden, North Korea comes forward to invite Marzuki Daruzman, who is, of course, at that time, the, uh, the Special Rapporteur for North Korea and Human Rights. They never invited him before, but they were inviting him to Pyongyang in the hopes that perhaps some of the aspects of the COI might not be translated into a UN, UN General Assembly resolution. All of a sudden, North Korea voluntarily released this, Jeffrey Fowl, Matthew Todd Miller, and Kenneth Bay. That was a huge surprise. Why? Because the human rights issue 
is sort of like an Achilles gun of North Korea. Another case in point, right now in Geneva, of course, we have the UPR going on. To the charges of human rights violation, what is North Korea saying? North Korea officially is saying that there's no violations of human rights. They have freedom of speech. They have freedom of religion, freedom of information. There are no political prison camps. If anything, and this is from the North Korean ambassador to Geneva, he's saying that various sanctions on North Korea is actually hampering North Korea's efforts to protect and promote human rights, which is quite ridiculous. But I think, you know, it just goes to show that North Korea is extremely sensitive about the international community watching over North Korea's human rights condition. And yet we have been kind of shunning these issues in favor of a lot of other political aspects. And therefore, I think the real strategy in dealing with North Korea, particularly if we really wanted to genuinely resolve issues like abduction, is to really focus on human rights issues. North Korea wants to cover up human rights issues. This is precisely why we have to focus on these issues and educate North Korea that if you want better image, if you want the international community have to have a better image of North Korea, that it has, you know, word is cheap, that it has to do something, that it has to take some actions in the human rights front. And it has to start somewhere. And I think this is where the abduction issue can play a very big role, particularly the Japanese abduction issue. Because when it comes to the Japanese abduction issue, I think the hardest part has already been done, which is that in 2002, Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un's father, has already admitted to the abduction. Of course, the numbers are different. He had admitted to 13. So this is a follow-up to the admission that they have already done. So I think it falls on all of us to educate and, and, and press North Korea to follow up on this issue. After all, when, you know, when it comes to North Korea, North Korea may be thinking that, oh, then uh, we might be accused of having lied again. Well, you, know, you, have to, you have to think, how much worse can its credibility get? I don't think its reputation can get any worse than where it is. That said, the upside can be quite high for North Korea if it actually made some moves to improve, to make some progress on this issue. It could actually lead to an improvement of relations with Japan, the Japanese government, and it could have a spillover effect into other human rights issues, meaning other abduction cases with uh, Americans with the with Thai and certainly the the moderator mentioned about Korea I mean we have over 500 uh, abducted cases and that's only after the Korean War almost 10,000 if you're including uh, the Korean War period so in a way I believe that the Japanese abduction case can be can serve as a litmus test of North Korea gaining minimum level of credibility and possibly worthiness to receive some sort of assistance from the, from the outside world. And I think this is the point that has to be emphasized to convince North Korea and educate North Korea uh, to make progress on this abduction issue. And it can begin, I believe, with the resolution on this abduction case. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Lee. Distinguished gentlemen, before we take comments from the floor, please allow me to abuse my privileges as your moderator today and ask each of the distinguished panelists one question. And Professor Nishino, the first question will go to you, sir. In 2002, the North Korean leader admitted to Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi to this practice of abductions of Japanese nationals.
Now, what the North Korean leader failed to understand was that Japan is a democracy. There are very vibrant civil society organizations that will never stop until they find full closure. What would it take, Professor, if some type of dialogue or engagement were to take place on this particular issue of abductions? What would it take to bring closure to family members, civil society organizations representing them in Japan? Uh, thank you. Thank you for question. Uh, the yes, first of all, uh, I don't. I don't think that Kim Jong Il could understand the power of civil society because, so as you, as we well know, uh, he's not a leader. He wasn't leader of democratic nation. But uh, if the current leader Kim Jong Un. Uh, really want his nation to be prosperous, he needed to understand the importance of public opinion, uh, listening voices from not only from the international community, but also from the uh, people in North Korea. So we should urge Kim Jong-un, uh, the important thing uh, is that uh, we should urge Kim Jong-un not to try deceive us again. And uh, we should engage Kim Jong-un to respect the power of civil society. And uh, uh, as, as Ambassador uh, Lee mentioned, uh, fortunately for Kim Jong-un, his father, Kim Jong-il, uh, already expressed uh, apology uh, for the abduction issues by North Korea. So now is the time, and uh, now is the last opportunity, uh, not only for Kim Jong Un but also for North Korea, to envision comprehensive kind of roadmap, including abduction issues and uh, nuclear and the missile uh, issue, uh, to envision the comprehensive uh, roadmap, the including the all of the outstanding issues. Uh, for his nation's the bright future, uh, what he uh, what he need to do at this moment is to pave the way for pave the way for the pave the way for uh, to be a prosperous North Korea, brighter future, realize a brighter future, realizing brighter futures of North Korea and uh, to be a responsible uh, member of international community uh, as a international community by returning all of the abductee immediately. This is, a, this is the only way uh, for North Korea to be a real responsible uh, member of international community and to realize a brighter future of North Korea. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nishino. Mr. Rivier, you have had countless contacts with your North Korean counterparts, your company, the Secretary of State, when she met with the former, the previous North Korean leader in Pyongyang. You have participated in numerous track two, track 2.5 meetings after the conclusion of your long and distinguished diplomatic career. I think we all remember President Reagan's words of advice, trust but verify. We always A for FFVD, full, final, verifiable denuclearization. Previously, again, it was CVID, complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. So verification is always there. But what about trust? I think that all of us will probably agree that there is a tremendous lack of trust as far as the DPRK government is concerned. Would it be possible for the DPRK government to focus on this particular issue? the abduction of Japanese and other foreign nationals begin to address this issue and start building up some trust that later on might be used in other areas as well. Why not? As we address those very important political security and military issues as well. That is a great question. Uh, let me begin by uh, sharing a little secret with you. The uh, 
the informal motto of our negotiating team uh, that was engaging the North Koreans back in the 1990s, uh, with all due respect to the late President Reagan, was don't trust, but verify. Uh, we learned fairly early on in the game uh, that trust simply could not be the foundation of progress in a relationship with, with the North Koreans. Um, I once, over several drinks with my North Korean counterpart, told him that. And in classic North Korean fashion, after I got finished saying to him what I just said to you, he said, I completely agree with you. Uh, he said to me, we will never trust you, and you will never trust us. But that doesn't mean we can't do business together. Uh, but business needs to be on the basis of each side taking a step in return for the other side taking a step, steps to be agreed through negotiation. And if you look back over the history of our uh, interesting transactional relationship with the North Koreans, that's pretty much the way it's worked out. Um, North Korea may be the most transactional country I've ever dealt with, quite frankly, which is saying a lot. Um, but perhaps in response to your specific point, human rights could be an area where uh, we could appeal to North Korea's highly transactional approach to things by making uh, quite clear what we are prepared to do in response to very specific steps that North Korea might take uh, in the human rights uh, area. Uh, and that is something that, that perhaps could be and should be uh, a subject of, uh, of future discussions, uh, perhaps between the two sides, to put that on, uh, on the agenda. Uh, but trust, uh, to play back what my North Korean uh, counterpart said to me back in the day, is just not on. Thank you, Mr. Revere. And uh, my next question will go to Ambassador Lee. Ambassador Lee, while you're Ambassador for North Korean Human Rights, you're an uh, extraordinarily active defender of North Korean human rights. You were uh, in Geneva, in New York City, in Brussels, in Seoul, in Tokyo, and everywhere. Um, we all know it's an extraordinarily difficult issue. As you said in the most recent UPR submission that just came out, all we see is just denial. Denial that the political prison camps exist. Denial that uh, abductees are still alive in the DPRK. I know this is perhaps an unfair question, but uh, is there a chance? If so, what can be done to engage the DPRK on human rights issues specifically and perhaps beginning with this very pressing issue of bringing abductees back home? Well, Greg, another very good but very difficult uh, question. I'm not so sure if we um, have a right answer um, to that. But I think the the traditional, when when dealing with North Korea, the traditional carrot and stick uh, method has to has to apply. Um, I think whether it's the abduction issue or any other. Uh, issue. There's really two ways to go about it. Uh, one, you penalize North Korea, the Pyongyang regime, uh, to the extent where the regime feels that uh, the the cost outweighs whatever benefit that it might have uh, in abducting or uh, keeping political prison camps or whatever it may be, that it gives up. This is too much. It might lead to possibly even the instability of the regime. So I think sanctions are part of that sort of um, matrix of putting the pressure uh, and penalizing North Korea. Um, and I believe that sanctions do work. Uh, maybe not 100%, uh, but there's certainty that sanctions do work. But on the other hand, of course, there has to be some carrots as well. Uh, North Korea is a very corrupt society right now. It may be one of the most corrupt society uh, in the world. Uh, 
You can buy everything. Uh, even the defectors who come out of North Korea, it is basically a business transaction uh, in a way. And therefore, I think there a combination of, of this penalty and the Pyongyang regime sort of calculating what can it get for giving up, um, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, if we are able to, you know, combine those two in a right mix, uh, I believe that it is possible. Nothing is impossible. But I think that there has to be a very, very significant and, and um, synergized coordination. Um, I don't think we can have you know, one country going this way and then another country, especially within the United Nations, uh, you know, talking about completely different thing because it gives loopholes. And that has been the case. Uh, when, it, when, when dealing with North Korea, especially at the Security Council level. So if there is a unison in voice in dealing with North Korea, especially if China jumps on board, I think China does hold the key. Uh, I believe that we will see a uh, we light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much, Ambassador Lee. We now have about a couple of minutes to take comments from the floor, if any. Well, Professor Nishioka, please. Thank you very much. I'm listening to the story today. The Kita Chow Sen to you know, Akuno Sonzai Dato. So no Akuno to Choga, Uso Skukoto. But I said, you are Uso to Tatakati to you who need a Jikanshimasta. 私は1991年に日本人が拉致されているという論文を日本の学者として一番最初に書きましたが、その時は殺してやるという脅迫状をもらいました。しかし10年経って金正恩は拉致を認めました。ただし日本人だけです。まだここにいる他の国の拉致はまだ認めていません。その嘘と戦わなければならない。しかし私たちは2002年に新たな嘘をつかれました。これが日本政府の作ったパンフレットですが、北朝鮮は13人しか拉致してないと。5人返して8人は死んだ。だから解決した。拉致はないと言っていたのが、今度は解決した。という嘘をつきました。私たちはそれは絶対認められない。例えば、死亡診断書を嘘を書く。偽の遺骨を出す。偽の交通事故の書類をでっち上げて人が死んだという、そんなことを認められません。ですから、すべての拉致被害者、認定、未認定に関わらず、すべての拉致被害者が帰ってくるまで、日本政府、そして国際社会とともに痛みを与え続けなければならない。しかし、彼らが取引に応じるならば、私たちは日本政府が国交正常化をすることを反対しないと言っています。李先生、李大使のお話、全く賛成であります。みんなで嘘と戦いましょう。ありがとうございました。Thank you, Professor Nishioka. Before I turn the floor over to the distinguished representatives of the European Union, Australia, and the United States of America, co-sponsors of this event, let me say that for us, and I know that there are other CSO representatives in the room, it has always been frustrating that human rights is outcompeted by very grave concerns, political security and military concerns. Japan has dealt with both sets of issues. Uh, North Korean missiles have violated Japanese airspace. Japanese citizens have been taken and are still being held in North Korea. What if this is the beginning? What if this is finally the opportunity to address the two sets of issues together. Um, I would like to thank, um, first and foremost, uh, Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga, the government of people of Japan, of the United States of America, of the European Union and Australia for their support and for co-sponsoring this conference today. Um, these particular governments have been behind efforts to address 
human rights at the UN for many years. And we do hope that these efforts will continue. We do hope that this coalition of like-minded liberal democracies and constitutional republics will continue to be as effective as it has been so far. That said, um, I would like to turn the floor over to Ambassador Silvio Gonzato, who is the deputy head of the European Union delegation. Sir. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Mr. Suga, Ambassador Besho, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some remarks at the end of this important event, which the European Union has gladly co-sponsored. Our discussion today has been a timely and sad reminder that the human rights situation in North Korea remains dire, despite the flurry of contacts and activities we have witnessed in the past months, particularly in relation to the nuclear issue. Against this background, the unresolved abduction cases remain one of the most striking and inhuman examples of human rights violations by North Korea. These cases, affect not only the victim themselves, but also their entire families. As we have heard today through the compelling testimonies of the, testi uh, of the families present. I would like to thank the families for sharing their stories here with us today. It must be a very painful experience for you to talk about your family members and renew their memories of their disappearance. However, your testimonies help us maintain international attention and raise public awareness about a situation of serious concern which goes beyond these personal cases and reminds us of the many other serious human rights violations which range from severe restrictions on all forms of fundamental freedoms, including freedom of expression and freedom of movement, to access to information access to basic services and goods, especially food, as Mr. Wombier was, was uh, mentioning, to mention only a few. These violations are matched by a perverse penitentiary system which detains arbitrarily in inhuman conditions many political prisoners. Conscious of the tragic human dimension of this situation, the EU has consistently included references to the issue of abductions in the resolutions we table regularly at the Human Rights Council and in the General Assembly. We have also referred to them in the joint statement adopted at the 26th EU-Japan Summit that took place some weeks ago. The Universal Periodic Review, which took place only yesterday at the Human Rights Council in Geneva, where the, the North Korea underwent its third peer review, gave us another opportunity to address these serious human rights violations. And in addition, the EU, including through its member states missions present in Pyongyang, has been raising these issues directly with the DPRK at working level in the framework of our critical engagement policy. Ladies and gentlemen and colleagues, we believe that human rights issues should be part and parcels of ongoing diplomatic efforts, in particular, the inter-Korean talks. The, case, the cases of abductions and the plight of the families affected by it require urgent action because time is passing by and the victims and their relatives are growing older, as the witnesses reminded us today. As European Union, we are ready to support any effort of the international community to improve the situation on the ground. But at the same time, we intend to continue tabling resolution on the situation of human rights in the DPRK at the UN. We will also continue to support the mandate of the Special Rapporteur and stand by the work of the accountability structure of the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights in Seoul. Let me conclude with a big personal thank you to all present today, and in particular to the families, to the panelists for their interesting contributions, to the Japanese government for taking the initiative, and to the minister in particular for honoring us with his presence, and of course to the other two co-sponsors for their support. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Gonzato. And now we're going to hear closing remarks from Her Excellency Tegan Brink, Australia's Deputy Permanent Representative. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And can I say at the outset that Australia stands by Japan in its efforts to see the return of Japanese citizens abducted by North Korea. We understand and appreciate the significance of this issue uh, to your country. This is fundamentally a human rights issue, uh, which I think came out clearly in the, in the really tragic testimony from the, the families of victims who have spoken today. And I think that victims telling, telling their stories and fighting to continue to tell their stories is such an important part of the quest for truth and the quest for accountability. And I really commend you all for your, for your bravery today and, and every day. More broadly, Australia shares the very deep concerns expressed just now by my European Union colleague about the broader human rights situation uh, in North Korea. The UN Secretary General's most recent report from August last year revealed very little evidence of any positive change since the 2014 Commission of Inquiry report, which was chaired by the Australian High Court Judge Michael Kirby, which identified human rights abuses uh, at the scale of crimes against humanity. And uh, my EU colleague has, has given some examples of those crimes um, just, just now. I think it's also necessary, of course, to touch on the security issue, which a number of speakers have, have mentioned, because North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile programs are a profound uh, security challenge and concern. And Australia, like others, is deeply committed to the complete verifiable and irreversible denuclearization of North Korea. We have welcomed uh, the talks between the United States and North Korea and between South Korea uh, and North Korea, but we remain skeptical of North Korea's intentions. And that is why Australia, I think, working with our partners around the world and, and those present here today, is committed. We are committed to maintaining pressure on North Korea uh, on the security front and on the human rights front uh, because there can, I think, be no sustainable peace um, without respect for human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Brink. And finally, we will hear closing remarks from the Honorable Jonathan R. Cohen. Ambassador Cohen is U.S. Acting Permanent Representative. Sir. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga, for making this important event possible today and for your nation's continuing efforts to address the serious problem of abductions. Thanks also to Australia and the European Union for co-hosting this event. We also thank the experts who joined us today to share their insightful views and ideas about how the international community can better address these issues. And finally, and most of all, thank you to the family members who've shared their stories this evening. We're in awe of your strength and support your efforts to call for accountability and transparency regarding the whereabouts of your loved ones. North Korea remains one of the most repressive states in the world. Its human rights situation is deplorable. The North Korean government continues to commit arbitrary and unlawful killings, forced disappearances, torture, and other forms of abuse, including sexual violence. The regime interferes with nearly all aspects of its citizens' lives and benefits through the exploitation of its people by operating an economy based on a system of forced labor. Yesterday in Geneva, the United States delegation delivered our intervention at the DPRK's third year universal periodic review, and again called for the dismantlement of North Korea's political prison camp system, which holds an estimated 100,000 individuals, including children and family members of the accused. We remain deeply concerned about the abductions issue and North Korea's egregious human rights record. We're committed to raising international awareness regarding Pyongyang's continuing abuses and violations, increasing access to independent information, and promoting respect for human rights in the DPRK, including by continuing to shine a light here at the UN on its violations and abuses. The United States stands with those whose loved ones were abducted. We'll never forget the suffering of the victims, nor the pain the families feel in their absence. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Ambassador Cohen. And uh, let me tell you that it has been an extraordinary privilege, a true honor to be your moderator today. Uh, we have gathered here today because we all have a fundamental respect for justice, for human rights. And as difficult as it might be, I believe that many of us continue to believe in diplomacy, 
perhaps there are solutions down the road. Um, let me once again thank Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga, Ambassador Besho, the people um, and the governments of Japan, the United States, the European Union, Australia. Your Excellencies, thank you so much for being with us today. It means a lot to the family members, to the victims, to all of us who have participated in this event today. And first and foremost, I would like to thank our distinguished family members, our dear friends. We know how difficult it is to relive those harrowing experiences every time you share them with the audience. And I promise you, we will never, ever stop. We will bring them home. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Have a good evening.